Okay, good morning, good morning. Welcome back. So today is our first day after test number two. I've got the calendar projected. We'll just look at it real quick. So um, we are right here. Today we're going to talk about something called Fibonacci numbers and nature. Today is class number 21. There are a total of 28 classes. That means today is three quarters of the way to the end of the term. All right. Um, so just a note. Uh, the plan for Project 2 is due on Tuesday. If you haven't started thinking about it yet, that's okay, but it's time to start thinking about it. At the end of packet number 2, you'll find a list of about half a dozen different project topics, right? You're going to choose one of those guys, and you're just going to give me the plan Tuesday coming up, okay? There was no homework due today, but there is old homework that you can take out of the folders. Uh, I handed back project number 1 to a bunch of you one week ago. And so if you were going to do a revision, it is due right now. I've already got one. But if you have a revision to give me for project one, put it in the folder. That's fine. Okay. Um, all right. So that's that. And uh, just in terms of the test, I thought the results were fine. Uh, the, the median grade uh, was something like a... Median grade was something like 77, 78, which is okay. Uh, so what I'd like you to focus on is uh, not necessarily just the grade at the top of the test, that's this thing, but also um, just thinking about uh, the different attributes that make up your overall grade. So if you look in this area over here, you will see your grade as of this moment. If the course were to end today, that's the grade that you would be. That's really the one that you should be focusing on. And if you're not happy with the grade, that you see there, well, there are different things that go into that grade. So right here, the in-class activities, that's showing up every day and participating. So if you've got a lot of absences, that number is going to be lower maybe than it should be. So don't miss any more classes if possible. The daily questions is just the homework. For some of us, this number is quite low. For some of us, that number is 100%, and, and it, it's worth 20% of your overall grade. So if you're not happy with that number, I'd encourage you to turn in every single homework assignment from here on out. There are only about six or seven left. Do them all, and that number will go up. The project, um, so uh, some of you have done a revision. Your original project grade is the one that I used, but if you'd like me to recalculate your, your grade as of this moment, as soon as I have the revision graded, just let me know. All right, we can do that on Tuesday. Uh, and then the test average is there. Uh, are there any questions on the grade? Yeah, Lucas? So I'm happy to, to relook at, at work that folks want to do if you want to like make corrections on the test. I don't have a policy in this class for changing a grade based on corrections. I think it's a great idea to look back if you're interested in kind of filling in the, the holes that you have in your mind. Um, but I will say that, uh, that the projects are worth, uh, individually, the projects are worth more than each test. And so handing me a good revision on project one, if you did it, or a really good project two, can kind of make up for a lackluster performance on a test, but I don't have a I don't have something built in to try to change a test grade. Sorry. If you'd like to do it for your understanding, then it's worth it. But it's not going to affect the. I don't have a policy where it would affect the grade. I'm sorry. Any other questions? Okay, so like I said, I need those tests back, so if you could just throw them into a pile and then I can walk around and grab them. All right, and today we start packet number three, the third and final packet. So I put one on everybody's table, so grab a new packet. The first page is a big grid. Everybody has a packet? Okay. So the first few pages we're going to skip over. They will have more meaning as we get to them. Um, we're going to spend a day talking about fractals, and you guys are going to use this page to draw some fractals. So you can skip past that for now. Uh, on page number three, in a few classes, we're going to talk about drawing things in proper perspective, but you can skip past that for right now. Then there are some crazy grids with numbers and the letters over on the right-hand side. This is going to help us when we get to talking about cryptography, encoding and decoding secret messages. But for right now, we skip it, and we start on page 7. So you guys are going to spend a bunch of, times, a bunch of time in your groups doing two different activities. So we're going to do one 
uh, group activity here on this page, then we'll come back together for a few minutes, then we'll do another group activity, and then we'll come back together at the end of class for a few minutes, all right? But largely, you guys are going to be working with your neighbors, filling in some tables. So let's get a reader uh, for this female bees example. Can we start with Patricia? Okay, so there's a lot of details in there, and let's make sure we're clear on the main idea. Everybody in this room has two parents, a mother and a father, but that's not the case for bees. Um, female bees have two parents, but male bees have only a mother. It's true. So, um, so the female bee has an egg. If the egg becomes fertilized, meaning there's a father involved, then the new bee that you get is a female, all right? So a female comes from a fertilized egg, but if the female uh, lays an unfertilized egg, then we can guarantee it is going to be a male bee coming from that, okay? So just in a nutshell, female bees have two parents, a mom and a dad, but male bees only have a mom, okay? And so here's a family tree upside down, <clears throat> and we're gonna trace the history of one male bee, and by virtue of being a male bee, well, what kind of parents does it have? Just one, and it's just a female. Always a female. If it's just one, it is always a female. But female bees have how many parents? Two. And so you can see this female bee has a mother and a father. Okay? Or actually, that's not what they stand for. They stand for M, male and female. That's what they stand for. And then a male bee has what? Has one female parent. Yes, right there. And a female bee has a male and a female, okay? I apologize for using mother and father because that's very confusing with M and F there. Those stand for male and female, not mother and father, all right? So uh, let's do the next one together, and then you guys are going to work in your groups to uh, fill in the rest of the table to answer all the questions on this page. And once you finish this page, we come back together as a class. But let's do the next row together. Female bee. How many arrows are coming out of the female bee? We're going to have two. So try to space them out a little bit. There's a male and there's a female. And how about the male bee? How many lines coming out? Just one. And what letter is F for female? Okay. Male comes from female. And then finally, what about the female bee? There's a male and a female. And then one last thing to do. Yeah, maybe it'll be every other one. Maybe I'd like to see a few more before I'm jumping on it, but I love that Patricia's looking for patterns. That's what we're after here. And one other thing we can do is count. So how many bees are in this generation? There are five. And so you can double check the numbers up above. This last column is just counting how many bees there are, okay? So fill in the rest of the table double check with your neighbors, and then answer all the questions down on the bottom of the page. So I think all of our groups got to something like uh, what I've written up here in purple. It doesn't have to be word for word, but the basic pattern that a lot of folks found was you just take the two previous numbers and add them, and that gives you the next number. And that wasn't at all obvious, thinking about just the fact that, you know, a male has only a female parent and a female has a male and a female parent. It's not clear to me why that happened, but a lot of us found that pattern, which is good. And then the next few numbers in the list, without listing all the Bs, we can just predict, oh, 34, 55, and 89. And then for part D, count the number of male Bs. I think we end up with the same sequence, don't we? It's exactly the same sequence, but it's off a little bit. And so some groups were thinking about how far off it was by doing the following. So if I had a list of the male bees, so how many do we have here? That's one, and then none, and then one, and then one, and then two, and then three. And so, uh, for example, I could highlight uh, the number of male bees right here is three, and the total number of bees is three right there, right? So it's the same list, but it's off by how many generations? Is off by two. So you could say that the male number of bees is two generations off from the total number of bees. It's two generations behind. Does that make sense? 
And if we play the same game over here, but with female bees, then we start with 0, 1, 1, 2. Nope. Let's try again. 0, 1, 1, 2, 3. And so I could highlight, for example, here in blue, um, at this stage we have two female bees. When do we have two total bees? It's right there. How many generations off is the females from the total? It's just one. So the number of female bees is one generation behind the total number of bees. Okay, so that is fine. Let's go to the next page. And we're going to try to make things uh, more mathy and less bees. We'll go to Morgan for number two. Everybody recognize these numbers? That was just how many bees we had in each generation. Okay, we'll go to Alex. Yeah, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. And so it's starting to look a lot more mathematical because of this notation. But I want to be really clear about what these numbers mean. When I say F7 is 13, the 7 is just the counter. The 7 has nothing to do with bees. It's just counting. It's just saying the seventh number in the list. And what is the seventh number in that list? It's 13. You can just count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The seventh number in the list is 13. Okay? So we got to be really clear about these two numbers. They are very different. The 7 tells you what number in the list you're going to. It tells you the position to go to. So maybe I can write that word there. The 7 is the position. Go to the 7th position. The 13 is the actual number that appeared in that list in the 7th position. Haley. Uh, commas next to the up here. Like here and here. Oh, uh, I was just, maybe I didn't need it because I spaced it, but I was just saying I'm listing them and separating them with commas. It's not part of the notation. Okay, so are we clear? The little subscript tells you the position. The number by itself on the equal sign tells you what actual number is in that spot. All right, we'll go to three for Gary. Okay, can you guys do that? But practice the notation. So your first thing to write is F8 equals. All right, what is F8? That's 21. What is F9? 34. And F10 is 55. Uh, F11 is the 89. Lucas. So, we're saying that the F is nothing more than a meaning of what happened. That's right. F is just the name that we're giving to this list of numbers. We could have another list, and I could call it A. It's just the name of the list of numbers. All right. Uh, any questions so far? We doing okay in the back corner there? Yeah. Okay. We'll go to number four. The general formula for, okay, and then there's this word that maybe we've heard of, maybe we haven't, called the Fibonacci numbers. That list of numbers with the Bs is called the Fibonacci sequence. And so that's actually why we call it F. That answers Lucas's question. Uh, we'll talk a bit about Fibonacci momentarily. But we're going to see if we can come up with a general formula. You guys wrote in plain English what the pattern was. The pattern was add the two previous numbers, and that gives you the next number. So let's see if we can't get that in symbols. So for example, um, if I wanted to figure out what F11 was equal to, I'm finding the 11th number in the list. What two numbers would I want to look at? Yeah, so do you guys buy that I should take the 10th number and the 9th number and do what with them? Add them. Do we see that's the, I mean, that's what you do. That's how you'd write symbolically, oh, just add the 10th number and the 9th number. And if I wanted to find, for example, the 48th number, can you guys write just a little formula with a couple of Fs in it? Good. I'm always going to say the bigger one first, but 
it's totally fine to swap them. Um, it, just because the way that I'm about to write the formula involves the, the previous number and then the one before that. But it's totally fine to swap them. Okay, now we're going to ask you guys to make a very big leap from the specific, oh, if you want the 11th number, you add the 10th and the 9th, to a general. F n. n is some abstract variable. It's just a generic name for whatever's there. Okay, well, what did you do? Why did 11 become 10 and 9? What did you do to 11? Well, how did you know to, to get the 11th one? You should look at the 10th. What did you do to that number 11 to know in your mind, oh, it's just 10? We subtracted. What? Didn't we subtract 1? Why, why did 11 become 10? Because you subtracted 1 from 11. Like, this is not a hard question, but it's so obvious to you that 11 relates to 10 and 9 that it's difficult to think of it any other way. But why did 11 become 10? Because you subtracted 1 from it. And then we became 9 because we subtracted 2 from it. Take a look at 48 getting to 47 and getting to 46. How do you get from 48 to 47 mathematically? You subtract 1. Yes? How do you get from 48 to 46? You subtract 2. So that's, that's the pattern. That's what we're doing. Just go 1 before and go 2 before. So if I am sitting here at some generic Fn, n minus 1, that's the 1 before. Super. That's the 2 before. That's the pattern. I promised you guys it was a big leap, and I stand by that. F11, everybody knows, oh, just F10 plus F9. But then we're abstracting it, making it more general. If you want to find any old n number, the, the, the number that's in the nth slot, you look at the two previous, and that's how we write it. Haley. Does it change the meaning? No, it doesn't change the meaning. You could put the n minus 1 in parentheses. All right, so I understand that's a leap in abstraction. It is what it is. We're going to push through. Um, let's see. So uh, we'll get somebody to read this, the above part. Greg? Okay, so first, uh, you guys maybe have seen the word recur. That means to happen over and over again. So how would you find the hundredth number in the list? Well, you'd have to find the 12th and then the 13th and then the 14th, and you would keep using this formula over and over again to eventually make your way to the 100th number in the list. So that's why we use the word recursive, because it recurs. Uh, but you need a starting point, right? You can't start the tree without having the beginning couple of numbers. The first two numbers in this list are 1 and 1. And once I tell you those two numbers, you can then go forever, as far as you wanted with that pattern. Okay, so number five, a little bit of history. We'll go to Tim. Fibonacci. Okay, so uh, can you guys translate this? What number is that? How much is X? 18. Yeah, it's 18, right? X is what number for us? It's 10, five, uh, B is 5, and then each of these I's are 1's, right? So that's 18. And then this is kind of funny. Yeah, it is 29. So those X's are each 10, but it's a little bit weird. If you see IX is actually one symbol, even though it looks like two letters. As 9, it means subtract 1. So that's 29. So, you know, like when I want to add in Roman numerals, do I just add i and x and then i and i? I can't. I mean, right, that i right there actually means subtract 1 from the 10, don't add 1. So even the simple arithmetic problem is challenging in Roman numerals. Whereas for us, 18 plus 29 is easy, right? Just go from the columns and carry the 1 and you got it. So, um, so I think that. Uh, we take it for granted, uh, the numeral system that we use, but it's a whole lot easier to do anything arithmetic 
with the Roman um, with the Arabic numerals that we use instead of the Roman ones. All right, we'll keep going to Lucas. The work. Haley. Okay, so this is the original problem. It has nothing to do with bees. It's just about rabbits. It's a little bit hard to understand, so let's just look at it for a minute. So we start with a, um, so first of all, we're starting with rabbits because rabbits are known for, we'll say procreating, right? So that's what rabbits are known for. And so we start with a pair of rabbits, a male and a female. And the first pair of rabbits that we have are young. And so in the first, so these would be the uh, months over here. You don't need to write this, but um, but one, two, three, we'll just go four months. And then here we're going to have the number of pairs of rabbits that we have. And in the first month, you have one pair of rabbits that they're just sitting there and they are too young to reproduce in the first month. They are baby rabbits, newborn rabbits. So in the second month, they're still exactly one pair. It's the same pair. But these rabbits are now mature enough to start reproducing. And we're going to assume that they produce another pair of rabbits. Okay. And so in the third month, we still have the original old pair, but then we have a cute little newborn pair of baby rabbits. So now we have two pairs of rabbits, right? In the next month, well, we still have both of these pairs plus how many more? Is it two more? It's one more because the old original pair of rabbits is going to produce another pair. But the pair of rabbits that were newborns in this month, they're still not old enough to start reproducing on their own. So actually, we only get one more new one there. And I'll do one more number. So now it, it's hard unless you really separate which rabbits are, are old enough and which rabbits are newborns. How many old pairs of rabbits are there in that three now? How many pairs of those three are old enough to reproduce? It's actually two of them. There's the original pair that is old enough to reproduce. And then the pair of rabbits in month three that was born has a month to grow older. And now they are old enough to start reproducing. So we have two pairs of rabbits old enough to reproduce. So how many rabbits will we have in the next month? It's going to be five. It's going to be the three you already have plus two pairs of newborns. And we have seen this pattern of numbers before, right? One, one, two, three, five. What's the next number? It's eight and then 13. It's exactly the same question as with the bees. Yep. All right. So good, good, good. So let's go down here to uh, this group activity. So we are, uh, Haley, you read, right? Nicole, fill in. Okay, and uh, Mariah, then? Then fill in the table on the right that calculated the gross income of the Add it into the class and the head of the class. Round your answer to the product that you need. Okay, thank you. So um, let's fill in the first few together just to be clear on what it is that we are doing. This is the Fibonacci list, so it's the pattern of just add the two previous. So what goes here in F3? is two, adding the one plus the one, right? And what's the next number? Three, and then five, and then eight, and then 13. And you're going to fill in, you're going to continue on the next page and give me like 20 of these guys, but don't do that just yet. If you do have a calculator handy, you, you might find it useful to use that as the numbers get bigger. But let's look at the right-hand column for a second, because this is new. So take a look at what this first one says. It says take F2 and divide by F1. How much is F2 according to the left-hand column? Yeah, F2 is 1, and F1 also happens to be 1. So I just get 1. Easy enough. Let's look at the next one. F3 divided by F2. That's this divided by this. So what goes on top? 2 divided by 1 is 2. I'm going to jump down and do uh, one more. Let's do this one right here. Uh, F7 divided by F6. Can you guys write down the actual numbers? 
F7 divided by F6. 13 divided by 8 is good. And then we'll do the division out, and we'll probably really want to use a calculator here. How much is 13 divided by 8? 625. Good. Haley? Uh, you're going to want the decimal. I actually don't even care about the fraction. I just want the decimal. And the last thing I'll say before I, um, before you guys go to town and fill in all the stuff in this table is that you're going to want to carry this to five decimal places. In our number, it just stopped at the five, at 1.625. Uh, but the numbers will get real messy real quick. And you're going to want to carry that calculation to five decimal places, all right? So um, I'd encourage you to fill in the entire left-hand column. Double check with your neighbors that you both got the same exact answer on the last spot, and then start doing the division. OK, so let's come back together. So we filled in the table. And what did we notice on the right-hand side? What happened eventually? We just kept getting the same number, right? And they might have differed after the fifth decimal point, but I feel like they were just kind of honing in on this ugly number. I don't know what the number is, but you guys kept writing down this 1.618, is it 03? Right, and, and again, there were, there were probably some differences a little further down the line, but it was getting closer and closer to that magical number, whatever it is. So we will talk about that magical number, but first, how would you use um, uh, F39 and F40 to find F41? You'd add them. Okay, that's easy enough. I've written it here in blue. I didn't do the calculation, but that's the equation. Finding F38 uh, was a little bit trickier, but the idea here is that if you wanted, for example, the 40th number, you'd add the 39 and the 38. Agree? So then if I want the 38th number, I could take this 39 and subtract it. So F40 minus F39 is F38. Do we buy that? Yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, a lot of people felt a little bit silly when they didn't realize subtract, but it's it's a new sequence, it's a new pattern, so subtracting will, will get you the previous numbers. Okay, let's go to number eight. I think we are over here. Kristen. Yeah, okay, so here's the symbol. It's phi or phi, and it is about 1.618, and then it goes on just like you guys wrote down. Um, it is not so unusual for mathematicians to give letters to numbers. What's the most famous named number in math? It's pi, right? You guys know pi is about how much? <clears throat> yeah, so pi is about <clears throat> 3.14. And there's a button on the calculator because pi is important. So if you happen to have a calculator that looks like this, uh, right there in yellow, right next to that cursor, there's a little symbol that says pi. So I can get pi in my calculator. Now, the second most famous number that has a letter name is one that you maybe haven't heard of before. I'm not sure, but does anybody know anything about the number that we call E? It's okay if we haven't. I don't know if we have any experience with this number E. It turns out it's about 2.7 and change, and it has lots of applications, but generally you don't see them until you take like a pre-calculus class. Uh, I, yeah, I is, a, is another famous one. That one's actually down here on the calculator. I is the square root of negative one. It's okay if you haven't seen those before, but those are called the imaginary numbers. So we've got um, this whole long list of numbers. I is I. Uh, if there were a fourth number that had a, a button on the calculator, it would it would be this one. This number right here is, is really right up there with pi and e and all the other ones. It's okay if you've never heard of it, but I'm just trying to give you a sense. This isn't just this abstract number that nobody cares about except this one day of this class. It really does appear quite a bit. Um, and so it's got a letter. We call it phi. And we'll go to the next page and take a look at uh, number nine. Laura? Okay, so it's a strange question. It's probably not one you've asked yourself, but you have a line segment, and you're going to divide it into two pieces. So one way you could divide a line segment into two pieces 
is by putting a dot right in the middle, and then we have two equal pieces smaller than the original, right? Or you could decide, well, I don't want to put it right in the middle. I'm going to put it pretty close to one side. I've got a little tiny piece and then a much longer piece. And there are infinitely many ways to divide that line segment into two pieces, right? And the ancient Greeks were quite interested in, among other things, aesthetics, this idea of uh, how to make things look good. And, you know, they didn't have, like, like iPads back then, so they had, they had sticks and, and lines that they could draw in the dirt, and they decided one of the things they wanted to make look nice was cutting a line segment into two pieces. And so it turns out that somebody decided that the right way to make a line segment look nice when you divide it is to have it satisfy this equation. You have the short piece, which is uh, how much in my picture? Short piece is 1, divided by the medium piece. What's the medium? That's the x, and apparently we'll want that ratio to be the same as another ratio. The medium piece, which is x, divided by the whole line segment, which is 1 plus x, all right? So those are the pieces. Somebody decided that the right way to divide this line is to make it so that the, the short one to the medium one is the same as the medium one to the whole line. And it turns out that the answer that you get from solving this equation right here is 1.61803, etc. You want to divide the line so that the bigger piece is about 1.6 times the smaller piece. And that's the